What's the deal with Macedonians? Deep inside the southern part of the Balkan Peninsula, squished between Serbia, Greece and Bulgaria, lies a country that, depending on where you may be from, could be either completely irrelevant or represent the most nuanced political question in the 21st century. North Macedonia, a country of just over 2 million people, has been a thorn in the eye for both Bulgarian and Greek irredentism since its independence in 1991 and a source of political intrigue for everyone watching the drama unfold. To a much lesser extent, Serbia and Albania have also had their troubles with the country, though these issues have either been solved in the case of Serbia or aren't as politically relevant in the case of Albania. Nonetheless, today in the 21st century, it is universal consensus that Macedonians are a separate nation from Serbs and Bulgarians, and the name of the nationality signifies someone from the country of North Macedonia today that identifies with the label. It's also important to note and clarify that this video essay does not align with irredentist views that seek to claim that Macedonians are just Serbs with a speech impediment or Bulgarians in denial. It also does not support the idea that the term Macedonian solely is to be identified with the Greek region of Macedonia that also exists today. The thesis that Macedonian nationalism is largely the result of disentanglement of Greek, Bulgarian and Serbian national ideologies does not make Macedonian identity less legitimate or more constructed than the others. It means that the history of Greek, Bulgarian, Serbian and, in the present case, Macedonian nationalism cannot be fully understood without taking into account the specific evolution of the other nationalisms and of the links between them. The national ideologies involved in the Macedonian question should be studied not merely as conflicting claims, but as intertwined narratives, myths, symbolic forms, and also social actors and institutional continuities that, since the 19th century, have evolved together and thanks to each other. This is certainly an aspect that the different nationalisms, with their exclusivist pretensions, fail to take into account. So, with all that out of the way, we're going to take a look at why exactly the political situation since 1991 has not been so great. To do that, we must go through a quick analysis of nationhood in Europe, a brief history of the region of Macedonia, the Macedonian ethnogenesis, and also a quick discussion about chauvinism in the Balkan Peninsula. But beforehand, it's important to clarify some terms for those that may not be as familiar with Macedonia and its history, so let's go over them real quick. North Macedonia refers to the country in the Balkans situated between Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania and Kosovo. The term Macedonia may refer to the entire region of Macedonia, which was popularized in the 19th century, including the entirety of North Macedonia, Aegean Macedonia, Pyrin Macedonia and some parts of Serbia, Kosovo and Albania. Vardar Macedonia refers to the territory of North Macedonia. It's an old name that is not used formally today to refer to it in most cases, but most Macedonians are familiar with it and it's used in historical research. Pirin Macedonia refers to a region in today's southwest Bulgaria, bordering North Macedonia and Greece. Aegean Macedonia refers to the northern parts of Greece that are traditionally included into the region of Macedonia. Old Serbia is a term that has had many meanings in history, depending on the period of time it is discussed in. However, it did often include Varda Macedonia, alongside Sanjak, Kosovo and Metohija. It was used to justify Serbian expansionism south of the Principality of Serbia's actual borders. Now, before we continue with a quick history of nationalism and nationhood in Europe, allow me to introduce the sponsor of today's video, Blinkist. If you're anything like me, you've for the longest time been finding excuses for not reading enough, since opening that first page can be a very daunting commitment. Well, luckily, the Blinkist app offers over 6,500 non-fiction books and podcasts, all compressed into very digestible 15-minute versions. With a wide array of topics ranging from science, tech, politics to history and philosophy, Blinkist's fantastic book collection and beautiful UI helps you broaden your horizons in a matter of minutes. For example, Blinkist has allowed me to engage with the key insights of contemporary works about capitalism that I've been backlogging and postponing. 
such as capital in the 21st century, inventing the future, how to be an anti-capitalist in the 21st century, post-capitalism, the economic singularity, and the age of surveillance capitalism. What's more, the new feature Blinkist Spaces allows you to create a space with friends and family where you can recommend titles to each other. All members of a shared space can access all titles within the space, with or without a Blinkist Premium subscription. So, support the channel and get a 7-day free trial and 25% off Blinkist Annual Premium by using my promo link in the description. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring, and now, back to the video. Before we can continue with the dispute surrounding the Macedonian identity, it is imperative to understand the key concept in question. Concretely, what are national identities even, and how do they emerge? In the words of Benedict Anderson, author of the monumental work on nationalism, Imagined Communities, nationalism is an imagined political community, and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. He continues by writing how it is imagined, because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear them, yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. It is imagined as limited, because even the largest of them, encompassing perhaps a billion live human beings, has finite, if elastic, boundaries, beyond which lie other nations. It is imagined as sovereign, because the concept was born in an age in which enlightenment and revolution were destroying the legitimacy of the divinely ordained, hierarchical, dynastic realm. Finally, it is imagined as a community, because, regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that may prevail in each, the nation is always conceived as a deep, horizontal comradeship. Applying this definition to an example such as France, no French person in a random neighborhood in Marseille is gonna know every single French person in France or the world altogether, but there is a shared identity between all of them. French nationalism does not encompass everyone in the world, but rather a finite number of people, with a vast majority living within the country of France today. It is also noteworthy, and this will be touched upon in this video essay, how despite the very obvious burden of class society and exploitation, French nationalism makes it seem as though all French people have a common united struggle and kinship that transcends class antagonisms. But more on that later. So then, what is the origin of nationalism? Well, the book's third chapter, The Origins of Nationalism, sheds light on this question. Anderson remarks how at least 20 million books had been published in Europe by 1500, with the population of Europe being 100 million at the time. It is this early print capitalism that began expanding into all of Europe's markets, most notably the literate population of Europe that used Latin for writing and reading. As Anderson explains the shift to vernacular language, he says, The initial market was illiterate Europe, a wide but thin stratum of Latin readers. Saturation of this market took about 150 years. The determinative fact about Latin, aside from its sacrality, was that it was a language of bilinguals. Relatively few were born to speak it, and even fewer, one imagines, dreamed in it. In the 16th century, the proportion of bilinguals within the total population of Europe was quite small, very likely no larger than the proportion in the world's population today, and proletarian internationalism notwithstanding in the centuries to come. Then and now, the bulk of mankind is monoglot. The logic of capitalism thus meant that once the elite Latin market was saturated, the potentially huge markets represented by the monoglot masses would beckon. It was this massive increase in print in the vernacular languages that allowed nationalism to flourish. In fact, between 1520 and 1540, three times as many books were printed in German than between 1500 and 1520. It was also the Reformation in Europe that had a major role in developing national sentiments among Western Europeans. With Martin Luther and Protestantism marking an offensive alongside print capitalism against the old European order. Anderson summarizes that it was the new productive relations, capitalism, the new technology of communication, print, and human linguistic diversity that really allowed for national communities to be imagined. In short, the newly emerging economic communities, consolidating around the most prominent centers of industry and capital, 
under the guidance of the newly forming national bourgeoisies and supplemented with strong linguistic and historical ties, set the stage for the creation of enormous nation-states in Western Europe. Think of France, Germany and Italy as prime examples. So then, when can the origins of nationalism be traced to in the Balkan Peninsula? To put it simply, at very different times. One needs to remember that the Ottoman Empire and Austria, the two major powers in the Balkans during the late second millennium, were at completely different stages of development and were dragging their Balkan dominions along their peculiar paths of progress. One only needs to take a look at the literacy map of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, a state which preserved many of the marks of the two former empires, to see how Slovenia, Vojvodina and parts of Croatia Slavonia had high literacy, while Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia proper, Macedonia, Kosovo, Montenegro and Dalmatia had high illiteracy rates. In the midst of such a polarizing chasm between two imperial powers, Serbian nationalism traces its origins with the first Serbian uprising in 1804, and with the linguistic reform under Vuk Stefanovic Karadzic. Croatian nationalism grew in the mid-1800s with the Illyrian movement and the promotion of the Illyrian language, as well as the resistance to pressure from Hungary and the Magyarization of Croatia Slavonia. Bosniak nationalism emerged in the 1870s, with the Austrian occupation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, where do Macedonians and Macedonia fit in here? Well, first of all, we can immediately discard the claims of Macedonian ultranationalists that there is an unbroken continuity between the ancient kingdom of Macedon and today's modern republic, as nationalism's appearance in the world stage is surprisingly recent, as well as the fact that the Ottoman Empire's centuries-long occupation of the lands have laid waste to any kind of possible continuity. As Maria Todorova states, the evidence, based primarily on sociological constructs, is far too fragmentary to warrant more than the cautious admissions of the existence of occasional sentiments in the ancient Near East and Medieval Europe, articulated by some individuals in terms strikingly similar to those of modern ethnicity and nationalism. So, while there may have been some proto-nationalist sentiments in medieval Europe, there's very little evidence that it had any strong role at the time, so we may discard this topic in this essay altogether. Nonetheless, the actions of Macedonian nationalists today, trying to project their current form onto past states, is ultimately what nationalism involves. It is no different from what Serbian nationalists do with the Battle of Kosovo field, or Greek nationalists with ancient Greek city-states, constructing a mythology and retroactively applying it to history for the sake of modern political needs. As a side note, while it's definitely true that Greek and Serbian national identities are modern creations, we cannot deny that Serbian and Greek both were used as terms in the past. However, this did not necessarily reflect a national identity, so mentions of these populations in the ancient and middle ages will be prefixed with ancient or medieval to make things somewhat easier to handle. The same of course goes for Bulgarians. Greek nationalists also aren't capable of giving good answers to the question of Macedonian identity as they attempt to project a Greek national identity on the Macedonian peoples of ancient times, including Philip II and Alexander. However, this isn't as simple as many would like to think. For one, it is known that the ancient Macedonians were not seen universally in the same way by contemporary ancient Greeks. For example, the ancient Greek orator Isocrates did not recognize the ancient Macedonians as Greeks, but rather barbarians. The same goes for orator Demosthenes and historian Thucydides. Of course, this does not mean that there were no actual relations between the ancient Greeks and ancient Macedonians. Peoples that live next to each other will inevitably have intermingling, and many ancient Greeks did see Macedonians as Hellenes. However, the fact itself that there was a divergence in opinion between ancient Greeks shatters any nationalistic sentiment towards the appropriation of ancient peoples. Immediately, we see a massive discrepancy and major sensitivity of Greek nationalists in particular, 
How do you reconcile calling a group of people who lived in the past Greek, when the ancient Greeks themselves did not always see these people as Hellenes? The only actual claim that can be made about ancient Macedonians is that they were not Slavic, as Slavic migrations were only to happen many centuries later. Between the 1790s and the 1840s, at least 14 leading Greek intellectuals, among them such as an important figure as Adamantios Korais, expressed the view that the Macedonians were conquerors of ancient Greece, that they were barbaric invaders and enemies of Hellenism. There is also another unfortunate fact that goes against Greek nationalist traditions, and that is that the modern territory of Aegean Macedonia has been majority Greek in at least half its territory since only the 1920s. Just like the Serbian conquering of the territories of Kosovo, Metohija, and Varda Macedonia involved a major ethnic cleansing of peoples, so did the Greek conquering of Aegean Macedonia, where there had been many Slavophone and Turkish people. And finally, Greeks themselves have played a major role in Macedonizing the Slavs of Macedonia. In the words of Kirill Drezov, expert on Macedonian politics and history, by denying the name Macedonian to a Slav nation, the Greeks refused to face up to their own contribution to Macedonian nation-building. In fact, it was the Greeks who expanded the meaning of Macedonia from just the Aegean region to include parts that were traditionally seen as Bulgaria or Lower Moesia. In 1845, the Russian academic traveler Viktor Grigorovich registered a change in the title of the Greek Bishop of Bitola, from Exarch of All Bulgaria to Exarch of All Macedonia. While traveling the region, he also noted that the exceptional popularity of Alexander the Great felt as if impressed from the outside onto the people, as those who mention his name often could not describe him without further reference to the teachers and their books on the subject. Grigorovich's writings can be found in his publication Putyashestvia pa Evropejskoj Turci. In 1816 and 1840, Kirill Pechinovich described the language of his books as the simplest Bulgarian language of Lower Moesia, and placed Skopje and Tetovo in Lower Moesia. In 1851, Jordan Haji Konstantinov Ginot would still routinely speak about the Bulgarians of Lower Moesia, but at the same time put Skopje in the Albanian and Macedonian lands. In 1862, the vehemently Bulgarian and anti-Greek Rajko Zifov knew no other name for his native land apart from Macedonia. In the 1860s, Petko Slavekov, one of the Bulgarian national revival leaders, was puzzled by the existence of compatriots who would deny that they were Bulgarian and would rather describe themselves as Macedonians, descendants of Philip and Alexander. It is also crucial to mention the fact that the term Macedonian Slavs was popularized by Greeks themselves since the 1890s, to prevent them from having links to the Bulgarian church and Bulgarian national identity. So now, speaking of Bulgarians, it's crucial to cover their relationship to the Macedonian cause and nationality, with a return to the Greeks later in the essay, when we move on to the topic of World War II. The topic of Bulgarian nationalism's involvement with Macedonia may in fact be the most complicated and difficult one to cover. For one, both Macedonians and Bulgarians are Slavs, so immediately there is a relation in terms of similar language and culture, but something like that could also be said about the Serbs to the north of Macedonia. However, it was Bulgarian statehood and its 19th century national revival that really influenced matters in the region of Macedonia. It's here where things get difficult to evaluate, as we must be entirely honest about history despite the omnipresent meddling of state structures. So, prior to the 1940s, it may be concluded that Macedonians in Varda Macedonia had some kind of Bulgarian identity, interwoven with a mainly regional rather than national Macedonian identity. However, the aforementioned historian Kirill Drezov makes a point in the cited paper that once specifically Macedonian interests came to the fore under Yugoslav communist umbrella and in direct confrontation with the Bulgarian occupation authorities, the Bulgarian part of the identity of Varda Macedonians was destined to die out, 
in a process similar to the triumph of Austrian over German-Austrian identity in the post-war years. As is to be covered in an upcoming section of this essay, there indeed was a Macedonian national identity even before World War II, though it spread and crystallized primarily during World War II in Yugoslavia. It cannot be denied that the Bulgarians, like the Greeks, contributed much towards the building of an independent Macedonian national identity. We must remember that the VMRO, the Vnatrešna Makedonska Revolucionerna Organizacija, itself professed a strong Macedonian regional identity, which provided a strong background for the Macedonization of the people in Macedonia. One can see the remnants of this regional identity in Pirin Macedonia today, as the people there declare themselves both as Bulgarians and Macedonians at the same time. In August 1928, the Bulgarian communist Vasil Kolarov stated that the Bulgarian bourgeoisie was pushing for Bulgarization and assimilation of the inhabitants of Pirin Macedonia. The following year, the Bulgarian Communist Party referred to the people of the region as nationally enslaved and in need of national liberation, which was to come up once more as a topic after the Second World War. Unlike the Bulgarians and Greeks, Serbs did not play as strong a role in Macedonian politics and its history besides very early on. This might make someone want to not include an entire section on Serbia's relations to Macedonia in such a video essay, but there is enough important information to include on how Macedonians went through the Balkan Wars, World War I, and early Yugoslavia, as that is where most Serbian action related to Macedonia actually happened. A discussion about Serbia's influence on Macedonia is one that is more suitable for a video of its own, about the history of Yugoslavia or Macedonia, not necessarily in one about the disputes related to the Macedonian identity itself. Nonetheless, with the liberation of Serbia from the Ottoman Empire after the Serbian Revolution, there was motivation to expand the country to encompass all quote-unquote Serbian lands. Ilya Garashanin, the Serbian statesman who wrote the famous Nacrtanje, believed that Serbia had the role of creating a large South Slav state in the Balkans. The Serbian geographer Jovan Svij saw the Macedonians as an a-national mass that could be manipulated as pleased and referred to these people as Macedonian Slavs. Aleksandar Belic, a Serbian linguist, viewed the dialects spoken in Varda Macedonia as southern Serbian dialects. The occupation of Bosnia-Herzegovina by Austria in 1878, after the Berlin Congress, meant that Serbia could only expand southward, as it was surrounded in the north and west by Austria. In 1913, with the outbreak of the First Balkan War, Serbia occupied most of Vardar Macedonia. Immediately, there was a ban on the Macedonian vernacular, and a process of Serbianization of Macedonia began. Varda Macedonia was to remain occupied by Serbia until 1918, when it officially became occupied by the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which continued the prohibition of the Macedonian language. This terror over the Macedonians was to continue until World War II, when the Communist Party of Yugoslavia was to offer an attractive alternative. Despite the fact that many of the individuals living in Varda Macedonia in the 19th century identified with Bulgaria and the Bulgarian nationalism, the birth of Macedonian nationalism made its entrance onto the scene in the second half of the 19th century. In 1871, an article was published by Petko Slavejkov in the paper Macedonia, where he describes young patriots that were labeled Macedonists in a derogatory sense. Slavikov claims that the Macedonists believed that they were not Bulgarians, but instead descendants of the ancient Macedonians and Alexander the Great. They, of course, had racist stereotypes for Bulgarians, referring to them as Tatars, and they believed they were of Macedonian blood, but also pure Slavs. Ironically enough, it was the aforementioned Greek propagation of myths regarding ancient Macedonians to the Macedonian Slavs that assisted with the fight with the Bulgarian church in favor of an independent church. 
By the late Ottoman period, a new identity was being spread, which was not necessarily exclusive with Greek or Bulgarian nationalism, but involved many Slav-speaking patriarchists to consider their native tongue to be Macedonian or Makedonski, instead of Bulgarian or Bugarski in the late 1860s. Nonetheless, in 1902, revolutionaries from the VMRO promoted the slogan Macedonia for the Macedonians, which included Macedonians of any and all nationalities, Bulgarians, Serbs, Greeks, Aromanians, Vlachs, etc., against Greater Serbia, Greater Bulgaria, and Greater Greece. The long-term purpose of this Macedonian autonomy was its place within a Balkan confederation. These VMRO revolutionaries still maintained that their identity was Christian Bulgarian, though, and did not embrace national separatism. Despite the fact that this movement was mainly political and not nationally separatist, it would be foolish to claim that it did not contribute massively towards the development of Macedonian nationalism. The Abecedar, a language book written in Greek characters in 1925, intended to be used to educate the Aegean Macedonian Slavs by having it written in their native dialect, sparked major uproar in Sofia and Belgrade because it was seen as a denationalization of the supposed Bulgarian or Serbian population, respectively. Interestingly enough, the Communist Party of Greece, the KGE, expressed support for a united Macedonian state in a future Balkan Communist Federation as early as 1924. In 1935, the KKE recognized the Macedonian Slav minority by adopting a slogan of full equality for all of Greece's minorities. And finally, in 1949, the fifth plenum of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Greece recognized the right for the Macedonian minority to secede from Greece. Similarly to the Communist Party of Greece, the Bulgarian Communist Party in 1919 recognized the necessity for a free Macedonia alongside Thrace and Dobruja as part of a Balkan Socialist Federation. As early as 1923, this right to self-determination took on a nationalist framing, seeing that the former supranational framing of Macedonian self-determination was taking on a nationalist framing in real time. This state was supposed to serve as a link among the Balkan peoples, and thus to facilitate the creation of a Balkan federation. The rhetoric of the document sounded very much communist. It condemned chauvinism and imperialism, advocated for the establishment of a united revolutionary front, and so on. Furthermore, it spoke only of Macedonians, Macedonian population, and the Macedonian people. The last term was distinguished from the Bulgarian people, as if it were a question of two distinct entities. Now that we've gone through a short history of Macedonian nationalism before World War II, we must at least briefly consider the effects of World War II and Yugoslavia's war of national liberation in Macedonia. After the April War of 1941 in Yugoslavia, Italy and Bulgaria partitioned the territory of Vardar Macedonia, with a part of it going to Greater Albania and the other simply being annexed into Bulgaria. The armed uprising began in October 1941 with the attack on a Bulgarian station in Prilep by the Prilep Partisan Formation. Due to the very pro-Bulgarian sentiment of many of the Macedonians, a fully organized uprising did not occur. It was only with the arrival of partisan leader Svetozar Vukmanovic Tempo in Macedonia in 1943 that Macedonians would begin rising up against Bulgaria and Italy with a strong Macedonian ethnic character to the resistance. After the victory of Macedonian partisans and Macedonism in Varan Macedonia, many pro-Bulgarian Macedonians were persecuted by the new Yugoslav authorities under charges of Bulgarian chauvinism and fascism, with a cracking down on those who wished to join a greater Bulgaria, but also those that wished an independent Macedonia. Thus, Macedonian nationalism was at a new height, with the liberation of Macedonia from fascist occupation and under the new leadership of Lazar Kolishevsky. We have experienced enough of both the Serbs and the Bulgarians. Happy was the day when we were rid of both, stated an anonymous Macedonian from North Macedonia at the end of World War II. Moreover, 
It was the standardization of their language according to the same dialect the early Macedonian nationalist Krista Misirkov had chosen to be the standard for the Macedonian language and nation. By officially allowing this language, which had been an actual literary language in many works in the 19th century, to be standardized and by giving much autonomy to the People's Republic of Macedonia, the Yugoslav authorities allowed for Macedonian national consciousness to rapidly increase and solidify Vardar Macedonia's place in the new Yugoslav Federation. It was the events that would unfold in other areas in the Balkans in World War II and the events after World War II that would put the Macedonian national identity to the test, however, and cause many alliances to break and others to form. The European theater of World War II more or less ended with Hitler's suicide and Germany's fall in 1944. However, a lot of questions remained open after the war, such as what was to happen with Italy's strong communist partisan forces, which countries were to be in which sphere of influence, but also the most important one being the question of revolution in the post-war world, when the West had nuclear weapons. Revolution was still brewing in Greece immediately after the war ended. The Greek National Liberation Front came into conflict with the anti-communist forces of the reactionary monarchy, backed by the United States and England. The fact that Greece bordered multiple revolutionary socialist states after the war meant that assistance to the Greek Revolution was indeed possible, especially since both Yugoslavia and Albania were their own authentic revolutions, rather than imposed revolutions from above by the Soviet Union. Now, the main source for the first part of the section of the essay will be Andrew Rosas' paper Incompatible Allies, Greek Communism and Macedonian Nationalism in the Civil War in Greece, 1943-1949. If you don't already know, Rosas is a very controversial figure in Macedonian history studies, as he's a person who at least partially supports the idea of continuity between ancient Macedonians and the Macedonians of today, which theoretically falls into nationalist historiography. However, the paper in use is limited to the topics of the Greek Civil War, rather than anything related to ancient Macedonians. So I believe that it's nonetheless safe to use to provide a proper look into this part of Macedonian history. Nonetheless, the Slavic Macedonian population of Aegean Macedonia played a critical role in the Greek Civil War, forming the National Liberation Front. While the Greek Communist Party had a purely revolutionary communist role in the Civil War, the Slavic Macedonians pushed for a form of national liberation and autonomy for Slavic Macedonians in Aegean Macedonia. Although the alliance between the NOF and the KKE was situational, given the contradicting motives, they both shared a desire for a revolution against the Greek monarchy and Western imperialism, uniting the two movements together for the time being. Overall, it was the Slavic Macedonians who bore the brunt of the fighting during the war, as most of the fighting occurred in Aegean Macedonia. The KKE's military arm, the Democratic Army of Greece, or DSE, had an estimated two-third Slavic Macedonian majority in its forces by 1949. That is, 14,000 people out of a grand total of 20,000. In the most critical theaters of military operations, the Macedonians constituted an even higher percentage of the fighting strength. Yanis Yanidis, a member of the Politburo of the KKE, reported as early as October 24, 1947, that they constituted three quarters of the manpower of the command of Central and Western Macedonia. Vainas evaluated the contribution of the Macedonians as first-rate and unique. Vasilis Partsiotas, a member of the Politburo and political commissar of the general headquarters of the DSC, paid tribute to this heroic people who gave everything. It sacrificed its children, its property, its homes. Every household has a wounded or a dead member. So the Macedonian fighters, realizing that the KKE did not necessarily give up power equally to the minorities, and fearing the restoration of old relations between Greek nationalists and minorities after the war, created in October 1943, under the direct authority of the Greek National Liberation Front, the Slav-Macedonian National Liberation Front. 
A radical leader of the Macedonians in Greece, Lazo Damowski, stated the following. Do they or don't they have the right, in accordance with the eight points of the Atlantic Charter on the self-determination of nations, to demand, together with the other two parts under Serbia and Bulgaria, to establish their own Slav Macedonian People's Republic? The Slav Macedonians justly ask, why do they not permit us to develop fully our national culture and to realize our national ideals? We are not Greeks, but a Slav Macedonian nation, with different ideals. How could we remain in Greece content solely with equality? How could this be reconciled with the basic principles on the self-determination of nations? As Georgis Milonas, a district leader of the KKE in Kastoria, reported to the regional leadership for Macedonia, the population is reserved, fear retaliatory measures from Elas. They look forward to Yugoslavia and the vast majority sympathizes with the separatist movement. The KKE accused the Macedonian Slavs of being Chetniks, Komitas, and instruments of the Gestapo, while the Macedonian Slavs saw chauvinism in the behavior of the KKE at this time. Therefore, the victory of Tito's partisans in Yugoslavia served as a beacon for the Macedonians in Greece at the time. They saw the national liberation of Vardar Macedonia as a role model for themselves, wanting to join Aegean Macedonia to the new Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia. However, all these dreams shattered and came to an end with the Treaty of Varkiza in 1945, which allowed for the right-wing White Terror to be unleashed. The terror campaign unleashed after Varkiza by the Greek right against the entire left was directed with special vehemence against the Macedonians. In addition to the ideological treachery of supporting Eam Elas, they were attacked for committing the ultimate quote-unquote sin for not being, or rather not considering themselves, Greeks. They were condemned as Bulgars, Komitas, Collaborators, Autonomists, Sudetans of the Balkans, and so forth, and threatened with extermination. And they paid a heavy price. Armed attacks on their villages, murders, arrests, trials, jail and exile, confiscation of property and movable equipment, burning of homes and entire villages, economic blockades of villages, forcible expulsions, discriminatory use of taxes and UNRWA aid, restrictions on freedom of movement, and so on. Under such conditions, wrote Solon Grigoriadis, a functionary of the KKE and Elas in Rizospastis in early January 1946, a mass exodus of Macedonians will begin. Entire villages escape into the mountains or seek refuge in Yugoslavia. I have seen Slav villages from which 19% of the men have run away. From others, 60 to 70% of the villages have run away, and in some, there is not a single inhabitant left. The tens of thousands of Macedonians who left Greece at this time would settle in Yugoslavia or escape to other countries to avoid persecution by the right-wing forces in Greece. The Greek army destroyed schools that taught in the Macedonian language, shut down theaters and other cultural institutions belonging to the Macedonians, and did whatever was in their power to harm the Slavic inhabitants of Aegean Macedonia. The right-wing Greek government settled Greeks in those places that were evacuated by the ethnic Macedonians. This sealed the fate for the ethnic Macedonians in Greece for years to come until the modern era. So, if the scene in Aegean Macedonia was one of armed resistance and heroic fights against the fascists and later American and English imperialists backing the reactionary Greek theocracy, then the situation in Pirin Macedonia was a polar opposite. Georgi Dimitrov, Joseph Stalin's right hand in the common form, agreed with forming a Balkan federation made up of Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania. In fact, Dimitrov was so enthusiastic about a unitary Balkan state that he stated on January 17, 1948, that when the time is ripe for a federation or confederation, and it is turning ripe now, our people, the people of the people's democracies, that is, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, and Greece, will solve this question. 
that the question of Macedonian nationhood was directly tied to the Dresden Congress of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia in 1928, and later the 1934 recognition of Macedonians by the Comintern as a nation. The Communist Party of Bulgaria followed the line towed by the Comintern on the topic of Macedonian nationhood, as did the Greek Communist Party in Aegean Macedonia. One of the policies that emerged in the post-war years in Bulgaria through the 1947 Bled Agreement was giving cultural autonomy to the Macedonians in Pirin Macedonia. Theatres and libraries were built, but the most important element was the usage of Macedonian as a language in teaching. Alongside education on the topic of the Macedonian language and history, the teachers, many of whom were sent from Yugoslav Macedonia to Pirin Macedonia, had the requirement to teach. The meaning and significance of the Second Congress of the People's Front of Yugoslavia, the People's Front and other mass organizations in the fulfilling of the Five Year Plan, the Five Year Plan in Yugoslavia, especially in NR Macedonia, the industrialization and electrification as part of the Five Year Plan, what perspectives and options the Five Year Plan offers to the rural people, and the cultural developments of the people during the Five Year Plan. Though it may seem that the Macedonization of Pirin Macedonia was simply just liberation for the Macedonians there, it was not so much the case, as the policies spreading Macedonian identity were indiscriminate and inevitably put many Bulgarian nationals in an uncomfortable position. However, things quickly changed with the split between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union in 1948. The Blade Agreement was rendered null and void, and in 1958, Bulgaria unrecognized Macedonians and the Macedonian language completely, with a new president, Todor Zhivkov, taking up a strong anti-Macedonian stance, unlike Georgi Dimitrov's sympathy towards the Macedonians. Moreover, Serbia's role in the Macedonian affairs after World War II are not insignificant, however, they are best covered in an upcoming video essay related to Macedonians within Titoist Yugoslavia in particular, rather than in one regarding Macedonian nationalism in general and its relation to Bulgaria and Greece. So, for more insights into that topic, stay tuned. To put it lightly, Macedonia has not been doing well in recent years, as it has been rocked by major ethnic tensions after the dissolution of Yugoslavia in 1991, and has been targeted by its neighbors, leading to sanctions from Greece and blockades from entering the EU and NATO by both Greece and Bulgaria. But how did this even begin? Well, in 1991, Macedonia declared independence from the collapse in Yugoslavia. It was able to escape war by disarming and giving its munitions to the UNA, which had effectively become a greater Serbian army by that point in time. Kumanovo Serbs rebelled briefly in Macedonia, though this could not lead to any serious issues like what happened in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, as a result of Macedonian independence, the Greek government immediately blocked the new Republic of Macedonia's entrance into the UN due to the country's name, flag, and constitution. Major protests erupted in Thessaloniki against the Republic of Macedonia, and smaller protests occurred in Greek-majority areas of other countries like Australia, for example. A temporary solution for the Macedonian naming dispute was to refer to Macedonia as the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, or FIREM. Nonetheless, on April 7, 1993, Macedonia became the 181st member of the United Nations. The temporary solution did not succeed in quelling down nationalist sentiments in both the newborn Republic of Macedonia and in Greece. In fact, it actually increased nationalism in both countries, in Greece due to the collaboration with the newly independent Macedonian government, and in Macedonia due to the lack of a hardline stance on its name. In February 1994, Greece placed an embargo on Macedonia which, combined with the embargo on Serbia and Montenegro in the Yugoslav Wars, closed off all major trade routes for the country. The embargo was lifted only 18 months later. Then, in 1995, Macedonia even changed its flag due to Greek pressures. On the other hand, Bulgaria, being the first country to recognize the newly independent Macedonian Republic, seemed to be in a position of understanding and solidarity with Macedonia, 
though this was not necessarily the case, as Bulgaria did not recognize the Macedonian nationality or the Macedonian language, continuing the policies of Todor Zhivko's Bulgaria. So, as a result from foreign pressures on Macedonia, many Macedonians sought an answer in ultra-nationalism, which created yet another issue. This time within Macedonia, with the Albanian community feeling oppressed by the greater Macedonian sentiment amongst the dominant Macedonian population. Ever since, many actions have been a product of this Macedonian ultranationalism, weaponized by corrupt politicians seeking to preserve power on tides of anti-Bulgarian and anti-Greek sentiment. Although the same could of course be said for Bulgarian and Greek politicians and anti-Macedonian feelings. One of these politicians, and possibly the most significant one, was former Macedonian Prime Minister Nikola Groevsky, who was arrested for various corruption scandals and abuses of power. His VMRO, DPM and E government, engaged in various acts of antiquization, meaning trying to draw a continued line between Philip II and Alexander the Great to modern Macedonians. It should be immediately apparent that the fact that Gruevsky's party is utilizing such figures as Alexander and Philip is merely a classical populist move, aiming to maintain a nationalist public support for their government, while withstanding pressures from Bulgaria and Greece. The culmination of this antiquization, Skopje 2014, involved transforming the Macedonian capital of Skopje into a more Hellenic style rather than the old Yugoslav buildings that existed prior, fueling nationalism in Macedonia to new heights. Furthermore, on June 12, 2018, the Prespa Agreement was made, whereby Macedonian would have to change its name to North Macedonia, but it also involved the recognition of the Macedonian language and the Macedonian nationality within the United Nations. With this, North Macedonia formally gave up on claims on the ancient Macedonians in order to secure better relations with its southern neighbor. Meanwhile, the issues with Bulgaria have led to many more controversies. In October of 2019, Bulgaria warned that it would block North Macedonian EU accession if it did not deal with the anti-Bulgarian sentiments in the country. Then, in 2020, Bulgaria decided on a compromise that was rejected by North Macedonia, whereby the Macedonian nation language would be recognized only if North Macedonia recognized the Bulgarian roots of Macedonians, which politically made sense to reject, because it would unleash room for Bulgarian irredentism on the territory of North Macedonia. Polish political scientist Tomasz Kamusela wrote an excellent article on the topic of Bulgarian irredentism in North Macedonia, titled Bulgaria's Secret Empire, an Ultimatum to North Macedonia, which I strongly recommend reading, as this video essay is long enough with all the history and politics on its own to include this article in any meaningful way. Nonetheless, however, in November 2020, Prime Minister of North Macedonia, Zoran Zaev, in an interview for a Bulgarian news site, brought forth the claim that Macedonians have been forging their history since Yugoslavia and that they and Bulgaria do share a common history. The outrage that has been sparked by this claim and by the changing tides in Macedonian politics, with more pro-Bulgarian politicians coming into the spotlight, have obviously and unfortunately been of an extreme nationalist character. So, as you may have noticed, this video essay was not meant to completely encompass all of Macedonia's history and politics, but instead was meant to be an introduction to what is occurring in North Macedonia and why. What it undoubtedly reveals, however, is that nationalism, in whichever form, does not and has never served the working class of any country, and instead only leads to conflict, embargoes, insurgencies and troubles that are not in the interest of the working classes of neither Macedonia, Greece or Bulgaria, or any other country altogether. I mean, what did Greek nationalists gain by getting Macedonia to change its name? Did it fix the Greek Orthodox Church's major stake in the Greek government? Did it end exploitation of workers by the bourgeoisie? Did it prevent collapse and bankruptcy that was exacerbated by European imperialism? Did it help guard against Turkish aggression against Greece? The answer to all these questions is, of course, no. Nothing has been won with the Prespa Agreement that is in the interests of the Greek working class. 
Instead, it has only been a major political game, designed to keep afloat whichever politician was leading Greece at the time. Are Bulgarian nationalists gaining anything by seeking to incorporate North Macedonia in their sphere of influence? The Bulgarian government? Sure, of course. But the Bulgarian working class? Not so much. Pretty much the same questions can be asked about Bulgarians as well. Is corruption in Bulgaria going away? Are the hundreds of thousands of Bulgarians leaving the country suddenly changing their mind in the light of improving living standards? Where are the solutions to tangible material problems that everyday people experience in the midst of all this ultra-nationalist intrigue? The answer, of course, is always going to be the same. Neither ultra-nationalist mythology was ever meant to address any of these issues, as their ideological roots can unmistakably be traced to the interests of the ruling class, interests superimposed and drilled into the skulls of working population through relentless propaganda. So, based on all historical continuity, material conditions and results of their relentless fight for self-determination, Macedonians, together with the Macedonian language, must be recognized as an independent nationality. This, of course, does not mean that Macedonians ought to keep identifying with extreme nationalist politicians that will not bring any better conditions for the Macedonian working class, but instead just an extension of their reign, opposed to Serbian, Bulgarian, or Greek. Not to mention that Macedonian nationalism is extremely hostile to the Albanian minority in North Macedonia. So, at the end of this confusing mess of a history, and in the light of the ongoing societal decay that has plagued the entirety of the former Eastern Bloc, we need to ask ourselves one simple question. Who will be there to celebrate Alexander the Great or Gotze Delchev as a national hero, with the Macedonian population rapidly disappearing? Well, Macedonian politicians obviously don't have an answer as they aren't interested in anything but short-term gains, so the future of the Macedonian people and the solution to all the burning issues, including mass emigration, is in their hands only, and can only be realized by overcoming the system that spawned these issues in the first place. Since the arrival of capitalism to our corner of the world, the intrigue around the Macedonian question has caused more harm than good to everyone involved, to the detriment of all the fragmented and quarreled Balkan peoples and the benefits of foreign imperialist powers, which in tandem with local competitor bureaucrats have been using such artificial divisions to occupy, oppress, and plunder the entire region. And Macedonia, as perhaps the most ethnically ambiguous region in the Balkans and the entirety of Europe, perfectly illustrates the tragic consequences of such politics. Therefore, a divorce from the nationalist, irredentist, and separatist politics of the capitalist ruling class is the main precondition for a better future of Macedonia and the entire region. Workers' internationalism, which transcends all national and ethnic divisions and draws energy and inspiration from the legacy of the revolutionary transformations after World War II, is the only way for small peoples to regain their national sovereignty and for workers to liberate themselves from the chains of capitalist exploitation and destruction caused by imperialist conquest. Only so can we reignite the lost prospects of constructing a united Balkan federation, a community of equal peoples and real socioeconomic progress, capable of withstanding all pressures from outside and within, prospects of which we were robbed by unfortunate historical circumstances, yet which nonetheless remain as a light at the end of this very dark tunnel. <laughs>